What the heck? Welcome back. This is Smart Nonsense Live. Uh, where we... <laughs> okay, Smart Nonsense is where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, challenging norms, Instagram. You don't get the good audio. I'm sorry. You get AirPod audio. Um, but this is all being recorded, right? We're, we're, what, what are you this, doing? Why? This, Why this are you is doing being this? recorded in a hundred different places because we're fucking crazy. I'm sorry. I'm going to start swearing whenever I... People are listening and start swearing. Tick. That's my tick. So here's what's going on. We're, we're putting out content. You guys are probably fed up with all the videos I'm posting. We're just doing more. So if you hate it, just follow, unfollow now or follow now because, you know, you like being a masochist. But, Belky, what are we talking about today? Because let's just get today, into it. Yes, we are talking about The Coddling of the American Mind. It's a book by Jonathan Haidt, psychologist at NYU, professor psychologist professor at NYU and Greg Lukianoff. I don't know what what's his deal. Do you know? No, oh, David's out already. Uh, his deal is somehow Okay, so really quick. Here's the problem <laughs> with live. You're not listening to me. You're reading you're reading <laughs> the chats, which I was doing too. They're All having right. conversations with themselves in the chat. All right. Uh, and now yeah, you're I'm not even at me. We can't have this. They're more entertaining than you are, all right? That's what I got to say. Here's what's going on though. Uh, I think they were both in New York. I don't know if he's some sort of scholar too, and he suffered from depression. And he's like, well, he went through this cognitive behavioral therapy. It fixed him. A lot of what they talk about with that, what is it? Cognitive be CBT. Co CBT. That helps a lot with a lot of the fucked up mentalities that we have nowadays from social media, from a lot of, about what this book talks about. Yeah. There's, I'm just reading them three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like biases that they talk about cognitive behavioral theory being a solution to. I think we should talk about those at some point, but we probably need to talk about their three great untruths first. Well, here, let's, let's first say, why should anyone actually read this? Yes. Book? Like, why is that important at all? belky has been obsessed with it for a while. You've been preaching this from day one. Why did it hook you? I've been a Jonathan Haidt. Some, some people say height. Uh, I'm actually not sure. I should ask him because uh, we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's like when we were calling uh, whatever the other Billy, author. What um, I caught on. Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. Maybe five. He's wrote a number of books. That was like a big hit four or five years ago about why people i'm getting the, i don't like this live thing it's it's you're it's getting the yips. my train of you're thought you're getting the it's yips, messing with my baby. train of thought um but There's it's basically about like one why. person <laughs> one person <laughs> i see all these chats know. happening i don't like it um and i've got two cameras to look at i don't like it he's talking about basically why people believe the things they do are true um and that book kind of blew my mind four or five years ago <laughs> largely what he comes to is like you two people arguing at each other doing this all day long like you're not going to change each other's minds we, we we've got to figure out a different way to uh come to terms with with one another and, and what he says too is like and this is another book I'll, I'll talk about later but um we focus on our differences right the and let's talk about us versus them at some point as well but what we forget is 99.99 percent .99 whatever to whatever significant figure uh as human beings like we're we're the same right obviously like life circumstances different uh like all, all kinds of things are different but we we forget that that so much of who we are and what we do is the same um and he brings that into coddling of the american mind i read it maybe our junior i read it when it came out uh i don't even know when maybe 2018 our junior year yeah and then i think i probably told you to read it a million times and then you just did this week finally cracked yeah it's it's crazy because one you have all these people yelling at each other and we heard it all the time at brown like people just yelling screaming it wasn't it's even at each, at each other no, it's no. past each other mm, sorry better two ships in the night baby or two <laughs> sailboats <laughs> in the night <laughs> call back to ie's episode 20 but God, I think so... you look terrible, dude. Just oh get God. get over it. So two big problems. One, that political problem. No one can talk to each other because they're talking past each other or refuse to even look in the same direction. The second problem, which 
is more visceral is the suicide and depression rates are through the roof. Like absolutely fucking crazy. Like the amount of girls, especially, but people in general in Gen Z, our generation, it's skyrocketed. It's up 75%, almost double what it was in 2000 for girls. And then guys, it's also increased. So that like, do you remember the why? problems? Because it's fascinating. Well, there are a bunch of reasons why it's the whole book. There are a bunch of reasons, but my favorite, it, it is the whole book. My favorite, not that it's my favorite, but the the one that was loudest to me was the fact that we'll talk about free play too. Well, there's so many good things to talk about, but um, the fact that you used to go to school, right? And you could get thrown around the playground. You could get bullied. I was bullied in elementary school. And um, that all ended when you went home. Mm. Three, three o'clock, 3.30 rolls around. You go home and like, uh, okay, you know, like it, now with phones, that stuff's 24-7, 24-7. And the difference between male and female is basically where males settle their disputes biologically. I'm going to use two adverbs in a row. Biologically, physically, right? Males settle disputes physically. This is These are mm. biological traits. Whereas females, as, as Hates says, burn bridges. And so the onset of social media as something that happens 24 seven, you can't get away from your bullies. It's always happening in the background 24 seven. That's why these things are skyrocketing. Um, yeah, just so uh, anyone listening to the podcast right now or in the future, the, the arc that I want to take it with this is one, where do we go wrong in childhood? Like, where did society start parenting poorly? Why are kids not the way they used to be. How does that transcend to college? Like what happens in college? Where are all the problems there? And then amplify that to the real world and how that whole uh, issue just magnifies with political parties, with just everyone nowadays hating each other. Does that arc make sense? Or are you focused on yes. your microphone? I'm, I'm focused on fixing my microphone, but that makes sense. Um, so, and, and to get to all those points, they start the book with the, the, their three great untruths, right? And I have them written down. There's um, the untruth of fragility. Essentially, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Hmm. Think about that. The untruth of emotional reasoning, that you should always trust your feelings. And you should, okay. And the, what, do you think, what are you thinking about? Well, I, I don't like that he... <sighs> I, I didn't like that whole part. I wish you just oh, framed really? it in the positive. It's too much thinking. No, I wish it's it's just in the affirmative. As in, like, this is... Like, screw the untruth. Oh, just, this oh because is, there's kind of, like, some double, double negatives Yeah, the on. double negative fucks with my head, and I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, that's tough. Um, yeah. Uh, Athena and I were watching a show last night, and the main character was talking about... He was just basically... He was like, double negatives fuck with my head. Don't do that. Um, the last one's the untruth of us versus them which is basically that life is a battle between good and evil people and those are three great untruths because they contradict ancient wisdom or like literature uh they contradict modern psychological reasoning on well-being and they actually harm the the individuals and, and the communities that embrace them so that they set up the first uh part of the entire book as we got here because of these, wow, my phone's going out. These three great untruths. Well, let's, let's talk about number one then with the idea of anti-fragility. And I, I want yes, I want to yeah. get into that. <laughs> there he is. Let's talk about peanuts. All right. Do you remember peanuts? You remember what happened with peanuts? Like the cartoon? Nope. The, the food, the nut. The, when the planter peanut died, like last year? I guess you didn't reread the book. That's what happens, folks. <laughs> Their marketing right. team killed the planter peanut <laughs> last year, and he had like a baby or something. Uh, all right, that's not what I'm talking about. Here's what killed the planter peanut. Schools having on their walls, oh, no peanuts okay. allowed. Yes. Absolutely. Everyone banning peanuts, maybe on airplanes too. You're like, oh, uh, sorry, this is a peanut-free plane. Like even dust in the air is going to kill this dude. Which is fair, but how did we get to the point where this peanut allergy just goes through the roof? And it connects to anti-fragility because people didn't used to have peanut allergies because we didn't ban peanuts. We we thought like not they oh, didn't use not they didn't have them. They were much much rarer. 
uh yeah yeah the like the it went from like whatever three percent to seventeen yeah. percent in terms of uh rates at at risk people but it's this whole peanut allergy and allergies in general it came from just us trying to protect people from the the original cause and then it makes up it ends up making it worse i should say so anti-fragility i know that was kind of confusing but it's basically like we're trying to do good by protecting kids wait you missed i think you missed the point the is I <laughs> no, no, you didn't miss the point. I just don't think you said it. That there's actually th that causation doesn't hold up when it comes to peanut allergies. Kids eating peanuts is actually right. what allows them to build the proteins um, to to fight those uh, allergens in the future. Right. The immune and system then, is the anti fragility. Right. Basic and anti fragility being um, like kids in this sense actually benefit from and grow from uh like being broken down in a sense right it's fragile. like there's yeah. there's resilience so like resilience is uh you just you don't get hurt by whatever the say you don't get hurt by peanuts but not only that but you get stronger you you build up this anti-fragility where peanuts impact you less than everyone else because you've you've been exposed to them and that's why kids you love it when kids go around licking floors and stuff because they get all this bacteria and they just suck it up like <sighs> It's all in there, baby. And so now you can fight it. Here's an interesting one really quick because I, um, I have this thing called inflammatory bowel disease, right? And uh, it's, it's basically inflammation somewhere in your digestive tract. And for me, it's, it's in the large intestine. And it's largely present in the first world. It's it kind mm. of the same thing as peanuts. Why is that? It's because we're so clean. Mm. Uh, especially, you know, especially like me, as, like you have to lick floors at some point. To, to build you weren't a floor things. licker, boy. No, I you got to start licker. Get get down. Was, it's never too late. I wasn't. Got to get down. Um, and so, if you look at the, if you look at that data, it's like this. Not only is a first world developed nation disease, but it's going like this as we get more and more clean. And, um, yeah. That that plays into safetyism, which. which he talks about later on well that's that's the biggest thing with kids is like okay uh, you don't have these sort of kids roaming the neighborhoods playing around because of these couple murders back in like the 80s that oh, just yeah. frightened people and now I, I mean my dad talks about stories of him hitchhiking to new hampshire where i even did this in argentina i was hitchhiking around uh, patagonia just <laughs> whatever like literally just thumb up on the side of the road for hours on end but people wouldn't do that like that's frightening to parents these days right because of the so, onset of it was like cable news and uh what what later became like 24 7 media right it was that um that kid that was kidnapped from sears i think in the 80s yeah that started playing out in everybody's head and what hate says is like the world today is safer than it's ever been right um it doesn't look that way online and so that's that's kind what, of how we there's, got here. Uh, what is it? The better nature of our angels, or something like that. There's a good what? book on this. How like people just become accustomed to the safer world, and that's their new norm, and they just forget how far we've come and how much safer it is, even in the last couple decades. So, yeah, safetyism. That's that's the big concept. People aren't playing out. I actually watched a video of the school in New Zealand, where they have no supervisors at recess. They just let the kids run wild. And it's like, our only rule is don't kill another fucking kid. <laughs> and like, literally, the, the only rule. And they're climbing on trees. They're breaking their arms on scooters. It's crazy. But then I look at my middle school, which is the most important years, arguably. And I was playing with my friends. I remember Jack Hall, you know, shout out to Jack if he ever listens to this. We're just playing, busting each other. And uh, there's this thing called gobbling. I don't know if you, <laughs> you remember no, that. No, Didn't have the I gobble. think it was called called something kinda, else here but kind of gross it's just something but uh weird that six-year-old boys did you just grab another boy's sacks real i mean you're both the same <laughs> you know nose diving on the podcast here what does this but, have to do with listen to me I, listen I to me this, for two okay, seconds so this right. is your i gobble him play i gobble him I but gobble. we're supervised so i gobble him it hurts like sure it's fine but it's not like me chronically bullying wait to get him. back to my point exactly yeah. when listen to go back to my point when he went home you could no longer gobble him that's a large <laughs> difference today. But I don't know what was wrong with you. 
Oh uh, man, that's such a. I just yeah. I was always memories. the one getting gobbled. I was just like, yeah, you, a little gobbler. You a little softy. All right. Where were so, you going? You cut me off. All right. So whatever. I do this to him. He's like hurt in the moment, and he falls to the ground and like shrieks like a girl, and because it hurts, and overcomes the the aid running, and she's like, "What happened? What happened?" And I'm like, Jack, I swear if you tattletale on me right now, he looks at me, I look at him, and he turns to her and he's like, he, gra- like, <laughs> he, gra- I, I don't know if he said gobbled, but he grabbed my balls and pulled me. And boom, in the detention, I got suspended two days for that just because I was hanging out with my friend and like, whatever. Okay. What's, yeah, Long what's, detour. what's the thesis there? My point is like, they don't let kids play and just have fun and find out where the boundaries are. So instead, I get suspended, and I think playing around is terrible, and like that's just the worst thing in the world. Um, so yeah, yeah. You, you long took story that, short, that that's like yeah, that's certainly one extreme of unsupervised play. Um, but regardless, parents are helicoptering around, just watching their kids twenty four seven. That's the main right. issue. There's no freedom. It's not like the nineteen fifties when there were so many kids out there, you couldn't keep track of them. You just let them loose. David's that back just happen. talking about gobbling in the uh, chat. You um, got to get out of the chat. Right. So so where kids used to fend for themselves, and my dad tells these, just, like your dad, just my mom too, like these crazy stories of the things they did before the lights went down when they were kids, before this thing happened at Sears when they were kids. Before, yeah, I was going to say before Ted Bundy. I wonder if that's related. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is, right? For college kids because it was college women. Yeah, exactly. Um so yeah so adults become moderators largely i want to mention this too because i this podcast another good podcast it's called uh how to become batman by invisibilia someone recommended it as the best podcast all time but it it talks about this and this kid was born blind and being born blind everyone's so worried they're like oh my god he's he's gonna have the worst time in the world like it's so dangerous for him i know but his mom this his mom was like, yeah, you don't need to baby this kid. Let him figure it out. She'd throw him in the backyard. You know, he'd climb trees. He'd fall out of trees. He'd, he'd try and ride his bike. He'd crash his bike. But eventually he learned through echolocation how to navigate the world. And so he's a blind person functioning like a real person or real person, like a whatever capable person. And other blind people have to be walked everywhere and they need sticks and dogs and stuff to help. But he never needed that because he wasn't coddled. He wasn't babied. That's an interesting. So I just listen to that one. That's a really good podcast. I don't want to belabor this point, but uh, that is one of the big issues with the youth. No, that's kind of interesting too, baby. because uh, if you talk to a number, where are you going? Where are you going? You're in my ears. Keep talking. Yeah. If you talk to a number of people who are disabled, in whatever spectrum of the word, word, um, what you often find is they're like, just treat me like, like you just, just like, you know, I don't need help getting up the curb. I like whatever. And, and mm-hmm. often that's, uh, often that's, uh, what's the word this, whatever. Um, enabling, but like, no, Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. I was, never mind. It, it's wanted, but I, I wanted a different word for wanted, but often it's not. And, um, I, I think that just gets to your point. Okay, so there's a decline in free play among kids. There's mm-hmm. also, which we've talked about in terms of excellent sheep, where we can circle back, the the college degree and competitiveness for college admissions starts going up. So then homework becomes forefront, mm-hmm. test prep, test scores become more important. And so not only are kids not indulging in free play, they're playing less because yeah. of these other quantitative things that they have to start building towards to get Which, into good colleges it's it's a fair pressure but it just sucks that that's the benchmark and yeah it sucks it's like kids at least till second grade like you should never be concerned about homework it should just be bare minimum and just go out and fucking you know wail on each other the other problem that we briefly touched on is this social media where you have three levels and the, the big problem is middle scores with social media because we were kind of on the fringe. I don't think I used it a ton. I think, but. yeah, I think we were right in between like the tail end of millennials where they didn't have a lot of this t- 
tech and a lot of the what we've talked about like tools that you can actually use for good and we weren't um like my sister like three four years younger that was like mid gen z Mm. and so i remember like i got my first cell phone in fifth grade it wasn't anything special i got an iphone in maybe seventh or eighth grade Mm -hmm. hardcore gen zers had iphones in second third fourth grade which is a huge difference. They, they grew up with this stuff. We kind of knew the world before it. Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think it's nice to have the before and the after because we could kind of see like the merits of not having it and, and work against it. But for those that were just born into it, what happens is, and Height says it, there are three different levels of why this impacts people and primarily girls. Uh, because like guys, their aggression, like guys and girls on par have equal aggression. It's just external. It manifests differently. It manifests differently. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Right. That aggression in males biologically manifests as uh, physical aggression. And in females, it's emotional aggression and burning bridges. Like I was saying at the very beginning. Right. So what happens then is social media and, I used to hate these topics, so sorry, we won't get political like this if you hate these normally. But uh, there are three different ways it impacts you. One, it's just bullying, like, oh, whatever. You you don't have many likes on your, your Instagram feed or, like, you have two people on the live stream instead of 100. Like, shit that doesn't actually matter. Um, people get concerned with that. There's bullying there. And the second one is just filters and seeing, you know, your friends be beautiful. You see celebrities being beautiful. You think the expectations are so high. And then the third one, and what he says is the most important is the FOMO of like, you see your friends and girls can have, or everyone can have it, but girls particularly will like purposely exclude someone or or share a story where someone isn't in it. And then, Belky, get your Gen Z ass out of looking at the comments and listening. No, okay, so the Instagram live, I don't know why, but my phone keeps dimming. So I gotta go, I gotta tap it. Oh, okay. All right, there you go. Keep going. So the those three areas, that's that's why it's really impacting people. And uh, Height has some solutions. We can get to it at the end. But um, yeah, we were lucky enough to miss the boat on a lot of that. And then you're usually mature enough by college that these don't impact you nearly as much. Well, okay. Yes and no. What he says too is because of all these factors – because kids aren't indulging in unsupervised free play, because they have social media and cell phones in their pockets 24-7, 18-year-olds going off to their freshman year of university are now acting like 15-year-olds. They're underdeveloped in that sense, in terms of like Mm. their ability to assess risk and problem solve. And so actually what he's saying is our 18-year-olds are acting like 15-year-olds. They're looking to professors for that adult moderation and his solution there is like uh sustain the or create the the new social norm that uh, people can go do service work or a vocational job or education before going to university or take a gap year before going to university i think that's smart it was interesting my sister when she went off to school um it was like every single one of her friends, uh, it's a generalization, but more than I could ever remember for when we went off to school, which was four years before. Again, they were the heart of Gen Z, right? Um, they got to school and within a week or two weeks, they were like sick of it, wanted to drop out. Uh, it was too much and they were homesick. And I just thought that was interesting that I couldn't think obviously I knew a few people, but for for my sister, it was like every single person she was close to. Um, And and that made me think like, okay, maybe these 18 year olds headed off to school because of all these reasons we just laid out, which if people are coming to live stream now, are going to think we're just talking out of our butts. Um, But basically those 18 year olds are acting like 15 year olds. Um, That's kind of where we're at. Yeah, it really pisses me off. You just tap in the screen like every thirty seconds. You got to figure that. The chat, no, no, we got to get out of here. The chat's going out. I got. All right, I got all right. Just fo- in. focus, Belky. Focus. I'm focused. Right. My so, screen's going dim. That's something that I didn't have was being homesick, partly because I felt like I was cooped up for a while. A lot of attention. On okay, me. but he, interesting enough, I did right. 
but I felt you like felt I was homesick? able to handle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. But I felt like I was able to handle it myself. Mm. And that goes back to second grade being able to like front the bullies calling me chubby on the playground. Um, it's like those things do make you anti-fragile. Sorry, kids are anti-fragile. Those things do help you grow um, into someone I, who can assess risk and solve their own problems. It, it kind of goes into why people are so bad at confronting others on campus. And I saw this a lot of like people would have issues, but they'd struggle to bring them up in person. And so they just kind of talk back or they'd call them out on social media later. And it's like such a childish form of getting vengeance on someone or like voicing your opinion. Yeah. And I saw that so often is people would just be like, uh, yeah, call you out for something they sent them. And it's like, dude, just go talk to the person. Yeah, that's what's what's really important. Hate stresses it too. What what call out culture does, what shaming someone publicly does is make them hate you. Hate you. It's embarrassing. Like it, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Um what's his solution? I think it's just have those conversations privately. Well, like, uh, it it comes down to people have to be more okay with having hard discussions, having debate. That's the big thing is like people are just scared and there's this what he calls concept creep or I, I don't think he invented it but this concept creep of people in the past would say like oh i am i am harmed by this and it usually uh, meant like physically harmed um you had yeah something done to you that does this damage. is I, I read the book a long time ago but this is something that i keep bringing up with with people i'm close to is the difference between microaggressions and faux pas right I don't want to go too far into it, but uh, basically, what he out he lays out that that illogical argument that I I wrote it down in my notes here. If let me get this right, if words can cause stress, and prolonged stress can cause physical harm, which we, which we know is true, prolonged stress can cause physical harm. Then, because harm is violent, then words are violent, mm. and and. Uh, what do they call that in transitive in property or logic? Uh, something. No, the ill. Uh, I forget. But basically, it's if A causes B and B can cause C, then A causes C. And what That's hate transitive says, it, trigonometry. Cuck. Yeah, it, it's something different in logic. But um, what hate says then is, OK, substitute in if if that A, B and C hold up, substitute in my significant other dumped me the day before prom. Mm. And then you have my significant other dumped me, um, which can cause stress, sure. Um, prolonged stress can cause physical harm. Therefore, my significant other dumping me is violent. Yeah. And it doesn't hold up like that. Yes, it's physical harm, but that, that's different. Um, that's a really, really interesting point he makes. I think it's really important. Yeah, so that's what happens is this people just start to associate words with now causing what in the past only meant physical harm. And that's why it makes sense that places like Brown have a safe space. I think it mentions like we were one of the first people to have it. And you have like Play-Doh and cookies and blankets and, and puppies on the TV. And it, it's just a world that seems absurd. But it makes sense if you're protecting them from violence. But right. that's not what it is. It's just another opinion that might hurt your feelings. And part of my problem is when, when you're kind of on, on edge, you're expecting something to trigger you. Like there's a trigger warning or something like that. Like people are trying to look for ways where it makes sense. Or like, let me give a different example. So say, say like, I don't know, Henry, you're going to hear Henry in a crowd. Uh, because you're predisposed to it. If if you just learn a new word, like, I don't know, coddling, you're going to hear coddling a lot more. So if you're like thinking about being triggered and it's like, like oh, watch out, this is this might hurt you emotionally, you're going to be hurt emotionally yeah. <laughs> because there's you're just waiting for that. for that one. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same. Like you just said, if there's a thousand people talking and you hear your voice, your, your name, um, you're able to pick that out of a thousand voices. It's that same mechanism. I don't know what it's called. Yeah. So you're just waiting to be offended by something. And it, the same thing happened with uh, depression and stuff like that. When you're identifying like, oh, do you think you might be 
depressed or do you think uh, you might hurt someone or something? It's like they're seeding the idea and you're like, I I've never even thought about that. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. Um, I was going through a really tough breakup uh, midway through the college and I, you know, like I, I just like couldn't do anything, which was rare for me. And so finally I went to the, the counseling on campus and, oh, this is so interesting. I forgot. And I take their little questionnaire. And one of the questions is like, um, have you had suicidal thoughts? And my mom had asked me mm -hmm. a whole bunch of times too. And fine. No, like never, never. Um, finally, I read that question and I remember marking maybe. And it's not because I ever did. It's just because everyone said I should. Mm. And it was fascinating because then I go in and she's like, well, the first thing we need to talk about is these suicidal thoughts. And I was like, whoa, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I was like, <laughs> and you know what? I think the problem here is so many people have asking have been asking me if I'm suicidal right. that I started to think maybe I was or maybe I should be. Dude, I that's totally happening to me right that. now. I totally forgot about that. What happens what a lot where... I mean, my mom's probably watching this live stream right now, so it's kind of weird. But, like, my mom will be like, Dylan, are you are you depressed? Like, the first time I ever even heard about that concept in my life. And I'm like, I'm definitely not. But people just can't fathom, you know, why I'd sit in my room all day and still be happy. And, and like, it it just seeded this idea. And then it's like, oh, some do you have a spectrum autism and stuff like that? And I'm like, shit, do I? And now I start to right. think this stuff because I'm just like, I don't know. And, I'm not very outgoing it's important, with her. Right. It's important to note that like that uh, questioning is important, right? It's important to check in on, on, on the people around you. What we're saying doesn't always hold up. Um, but it's just curious to me that we, we both have a pretty relevant example of like we feel totally fine, totally happy, mostly happy. And in, in my case, at least. And then someone seeds this idea in your mind and you're like, oh, OK, maybe not. And he talks about... Um, in, and then what? I think we got to get out of here. Um, the the common cognitive disorders that cognitive behavioral theory can help um, solve. And the one we're talking about, I think, is emotional reasoning. Basically, I feel, no. There's a whole list of them. It's emotional reasoning, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing. Over it might be identifying. Um, as in, maybe. I, I don't know the whole list off the top of my head, but I do think that's a where people just start identifying as a certain person. Like that's why I try and actively not be like, Oh, I identify as a liberal or conservative or whatever. Oh, it's labeling. Republican. It's labeling, assigning global negative traits to yourself or others. Um, often to serve dichotomous thinking, which, which is that us versus them. Um, wow. We might have to do a whole nother episode on this. Here's the, I, I usually hate these topics because one, uh, I just, you know, I stay out of the political realm as much as possible. I went down, like I started super left, you know, I was posting a, a ton freshman year and then I started, like, I have that Mark Twain quote that I quote. Wait, that what I does posted. your leftyism have to do with posting? Well, I posted a lot of left leaning stuff oh. and I, I was just immersed in that world. I was like, Oh, I mean, I want to change the world, et cetera. But then I saw the extent, like, well, you even can't the change stuff the world anymore. I can always change the world, but I, I started getting fed up with the extent that they took it and they'd even get like angry at stuff that I was doing, like saying that's yeah. crazy could be a microaggression. I'm like, all right, this, this a line, like people are getting absurd. And yeah. even you said oh, like, oh, that's what gypped. I was talking about before. What? I said, you said gypped the other day, which is technically like oh, a, could be a, a microaggression against people that are into that. So. Yes, it could be. And they talk about in the book too, the second half of the definition for microaggression is subjective, which makes it so difficult. Um, but it, I would characterize it more like, okay, first of all, if that is a microaggression, right? Like I'll stop saying gypped. But in the sense that I said it, it's faux pas, right? Like it's a, in French, not to do. Mm. That's a kind of a bad example of one because I feel like it's so common. Um, but yeah. So I think, all right, let's just get into, oh, there's, I don't know. Do you want to talk it about up. it again? Wrap all it right. up. Well, there's some some potential solutions, but I don't know if we want to get into some. Oh, more there's so many solutions. Um, I one of my favorites was probably prepare the child for the road, not the road for the mm. child, and that goes back to so much of what we talked about: anti fragility, um, unsupervised free play. Right? Is um, 
there's another book called Range, where basically the the world is oh I can't remember it. What what's happening in the world is oh it's weird. I think the acronym is weird. I think it's weird. But basically, it's not like like you can't just formulate everything that happens in the world. You need to have your toolkit of reasoning and rationality and problem solving and risk assessment to go in and solve those problems for yourself. Mm. Um, and so preparing your child for the road, as opposed to trying to alter the world or create safe spaces on campus or do all these things for your child, uh, I think we're starting to see isn't going to work. I, I think to you go back to 1960s you, where you just run around until the lights go on. Anyone just joining you have to come back to the 1960s, certain areas. But like, I think you need the same way there are those safe spaces of like, here's your protected area. You need like debate spaces where mm. this is just acknowledge that you're going to come in. You want to argue the other side, hear the other side, try and empathize with them. That's why I love my persuasive communication class is because the last speech we gave was what like try and incite change and so you had to pick the most controversial topic possible i picked that uh the women's world soccer team deserved less pay like very like heavy topics people were like viscerally upset for everyone who just came in dylan said that the women's <laughs> uh olympic soccer team deserves less pay yeah so i had to argue that and like Wow. You, know, you start at the most polar possible and you try and convince everyone, but you hear both sides in, in debate afterward. And so wow. that was so rare at Brown. I think it needs a lot more because I got into a realm that was far from liberal, and I think people couldn't hear the other side very often, but I got to hear everything. Oh, this what, is something. Uh, what was the outcome of doing that in that class? Was it generally like. What, what, people didn't like get upset. Was, yeah. Yeah, because one, when they actually hear your arguments well laid out, instead of just, you know, plugging their ears, they realize there's a lot of merit to what you're saying. Yeah. And justice, like people generally, the book talks about this, but people generally agree on what's just, right? You have, like, you want people to some sort of merit, like you, you get what you deserve, like you, the effort that you put in, and the system's not screwed against you. Um, he has words for him, but I forget. So people agree on justice. I think there are just some finer points where people disagree and they blow it out of proportion. Um, so I got to hear a lot of both sides, but I think few people at Brown did get that balance. And so like the Ratty, for example, only had CNN 24 seven. Imagine if mm. it had Fox news on like one day a week mm. just to get yeah. people like thinking about what the other side sees. I think that we didn't important. even get, we didn't even get into that Ugh. amongst scholars too. I wanted um, to get into like what the next day after Trump was elected, what that was like, just some other stories. Oh, there's so much that I want to talk about. but Yeah, I think the one important one, because Brown was featured in the book. Brown was kind of the birthplace of these safe spaces, I think, mm -hmm. right? At least Hate says so. Yeah. Um, I had made a video. I'd read this book. My sister was going off to college. I wrote her a letter about 25 things I wish I knew as a college freshman, mm -hmm. largely based around kind of the inner workings of this book. And I remember as a marketing bit, I was talking with, I forget their position at Brown, um, about promoting my video to the incoming class of, of Brown students because I, I thought it would be helpful. And they were all on board. They were stoked about it. Um, I gave them the 25 points. I showed them the letter. They were like, yes, yes, yes. All 25, awesome. We want to share this. Then I make the video and the last minute of the video is me plugging this book. And so finally, like, I'm, I'm like, it's live. I'm ready for you all to share the video. And the lead contact that I had at Brown was like, well, unfortunately, we can't do that because you're promoting this book. Um, really? Yeah. And then they were like, this is we can't, coddling of the we, American mind. This was Those... coddling of the American mind. And they said they couldn't endorse it. I don't know if that's true or not, but it just made me wonder. Uh, if it were a different book at the end of that. Well, the, we read The video. New Jim Crow as our first book. Okay, so let me let me take this back. Um, I was in communication with Jonathan Haidt because I shared the video with him. He loved it. And I, I sent him an email. I kind of let the brown thing go to rest. I just didn't really care. And I sent Jonathan Haidt an email. And I said, huh, this was very curious, Professor Haidt. 
And I wonder what would have happened if the book I plugged at the end of that video was the new Jim Crow, because they were endorsing that when, when, mm. when we went off. Um, great book, by the way, great book. But uh, it was just interesting that, that, I mean, of course they didn't want to endorse this book that was so kind of anti-Brown in a lot of respects. I think, but that's, that's what makes your argument stronger is when you, you hear the counter arguments and then you can defend against them better. Like when right. I'd always say my libertarian shit to my friends, I'd realize a lot of my ideas were fucked. Like you need a little bit of the paternalism. You need some, some more, whatever, democratic sort of ideals to, to make things function properly. So I, I was proved wrong in a lot of ways. And plus I learned a lot of ways to argue better or not argue, but discuss topics better. And I think Brown just puts people in a bubble and is like, all right, the world's going to be safe for you. And then it all pops when you walk through the gates again and you're like, oh, shit. Uh, well, th they live in New York, so they pretty much kind of stay in their own bubble. But the, the world's a lot different than what you think. I think that's why partly it's awesome that my family, like we we vote on both sides. So like I have some family that voted for Trump, some that voted for Hillary, et cetera. I get to see both perspectives. And it's fascinating. Like my news feed is just every which way. And I think not many people have that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's wrap up there. That was Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and and Greg 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 Lukianov. Lukiano? Yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. I don't know where the, the emphasis on the intonation goes. Pop. Um we'll be back tomorrow. People should subscribe. They should leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. And I don't know if I don't know if we're gonna keep doing these live. I was really thrown off, but uh, you you were rattled in the beginning. Same way with the podcast. If you listen to episode one and two, <laughs> we'll we'll see. I, I like them. Um, I think it'll get better and better, and you'll be less distracted. You'll have your shit dimming less. Um, but True. tomorrow too, with guests we probably won't do them because you don't want to put the pressure on them. But we have an awesome guest, Ian, from my hockey team back in college. He's in the crypto world right now and just exploring. I'm blockchain. so excited for that. I'm so excited mm. for that. I don't want to so say episode, I'm so anti-crypto, but I don't get it. That's it, though. That's it. That's the debate I want. Is like uh, you just exactly. you get people in a room exactly. and figure out the truth. So we'll do that tomorrow. Um, probably not live, but we'll be live again at some point in the next week. All right, Sweet. see y'all. See ya.